Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, election 2014, Democratic candidates for U.S. Congressional District 1. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahialani Richardson, your host for tonight's show. One of the four seats in Hawaii's congressional delegation is wide open. The incumbent Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa is vacating the seat to challenge U.S. Senator Brian Schatz. Seven Democrats, two women, and five men have launched campaigns to be Hawaii's next District 1 lawmaker in the United States House of Representatives. Tonight, Insights brings you all seven Democratic candidates vying to represent Hawaii in Washington, D.C. We invite you to join our conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. Tonight, the seating arrangement and the order of questions was done by random draw. And now to our candidates. Mark Takai is the current elected representative for House District 33 in IAEA and served as the chairman of the House Veterans, Military and Interdisciplinary Affairs and Culture and the Arts Committee. He's been elected nine times to the State House since his first campaign in 1994. Joey Manahan is the city councilman representing Kalihi to IAEA, a position he's held since 2012. He currently chairs the Committee on Parks and Consumer Services. From 2006 to 2012, he was a member of the State House of Representatives to Kali from 4th Kalihi Kai to Kapalama Communities and served as vice speaker in the State House. Donna Mercado Kim is the current State Senate President, a position she's held since 2013. She's been in the Senate since 2000 and represents the 14th District, Kapa Lama to Aiea. She spent 32 years as an elected official in the State Senate, House, and the Honolulu City Council. Stanley Chang is currently the city councilman representing East Honolulu and Waikiki. He is a first-term politician, is the chairman of the city council's Public Works and Sustainability Committee, and vice chairman of the council's Budget Committee. Will Asparo is the current senator representing Eva Beach. He's been a lawmaker since 2012, first as a state representative and later as a state senator, where he served as the majority floor leader. He presently is the chair of the Senate Public Safety and Military Affairs Committee. My apologies, that was 2000. And Catherine Gian is a filmmaker and executive director of the Pacific Alliance to Stop Slavery. Since 2005, Ms. Gian has helped pass eight laws related to human trafficking. She's also the chairwoman and founder of the Emilani Community Organic Garden at her church, which provides access to free organic vegetables. Andy Kaika Anderson is a two-term Honolulu City Councilman serving the Windward District of Oahu. He is the current Vice Chairman of the Council and has worked in the state and city government for 16 years. Well, tonight I wanted to welcome all of you. This is certainly a first for PBS Hawaii, so welcome again to Thank all you. of you. Thank you. And the first question goes to Representative Mark Takai. What makes you more qualified to serve in the United States Congress over the other candidates? Well, I've served in the State House for 20 years, and during that time I've spent, uh, I've, I focused my energies on education, sustainability, and military affairs. Those three issues have applicability at the f federal level. The other thing I wanted to mention is that I, uh, my wife and I have committed ourselves to this race, and should we get elected, uh, we would like to dedicate 20 years uh, to the seat. And I think it's very important for someone serving in the congressional seat to do that because as we all know seniority matters in the US Congress and we're willing to put in the time. Councilman Manahan? Hey, Why are you more qualified than the other candidates? Well, you know, my head out of, out of the candidates here of seven people, I'm one of uh, two candidates who can say that they've been elected to serve in two levels of government. That is the Honolulu City Council as well as the Hawaii State, Re uh, the Hawaii State House of Representatives. In the Hawaii State House of Representatives, I held two leadership positions, the vice speaker position, which you mentioned, but I was also the chairman of the uh, Tourism, Culture, International Affairs Committee. And it's through that service uh, that I've come to realize that the uh, future of our state's economy, our sustainability, and our security uh, really depends on the modernization of our harbors, our airports, and our military. And that's something I've been working on for the past eight years, and I'd like to continue that uh, should I become a member of Congress. 
Senator Kim, same question. What makes you more qualified than the other candidates? Well, c clearly, I have the most experience than everyone here, and I have served in all levels. I have served in the House of Representatives as well as on the Honolulu City Council and in the State Senate and now currently as Senate President. I've also held positions such as the chair of the Ways and Means Committee where I have to manage and balance $20 billion budget, which is no small feat. Um, keeping that budget together and making sure that we meet all of the needs. I've also revamped the Hawaii Tourism Authority, the entity that oversees our tourism market, which is our number one industry. And I've chaired the Investigative um, Accountability Committee, which held accountable the airports as well as the University of Hawaii. And uh, I've clearly have had this experience over all of the other candidates. I've also uh, had small business experience. I ran a small business and started it from scratch. And finally, I think the fact that I am a mom, uh, no one else here can claim that, uh, the fact that I have that perspective. So clearly, I think that that experience and the fact that I've been on the forefront of many, many issues, I will be in front of them in the Congress as well. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Councilman Chang, your response? I'm the candidate of change and fresh ideas and progressive values here. I've had a great record of experience on the City Council, f tripling our road budget, greatly increasing the budget to house the homeless, banning smoking at our parks and beaches. And at the federal level, I've pledged never ever to cut Social Security and Medicare. I want to um, be a champion for LGBT rights. I'd like to expand education by offering universal preschool and um, low interest student loans as well as comprehensive immigration reform. I think that by creating good jobs and new industries for our young people and protecting our seniors, we're not just going to be advancing our civil rights, but we're going to be moving our economy forward as well. Senator Espero, what makes you more qualified than the other candidates? I have almost 32 years of varied and diverse background and experiences. I worked with the city and county and the state government for 22 years. I have 10 years of private sector and nonprofit experience with companies such as Cheney Brooks, First Hawaiian Credit Corps, Coalition for a Drug-Free Hawaii, D.R. Horton, Schuler, and many other companies. I'm the Senate Majority Floor Leader. I have passed 87 bills in the legislature and many of my bills have impacted all of Hawaii's residents today. In particular, the issues that fall under my committee have included prisons, jails, inmate issues, state sheriffs, national guards, civil defense, city issues, police, fire, emergency services, and I've been the strongest proponent of the aerospace industry in Hawaii. Plus, when you add my over 25 years of community service, from coaching AYO soccer to even serving on the neighborhood board, being on school boards, you can see that my experience and background is varied and will benefit all of the people of Hawaii. Ms. Jian, what qualifies you more than the other candidates? I believe that uh, Congress persons need to be more representative of the people that they serve. And Congress has, challenged, has been challenged with uh, always choosing between corporate interests uh, for the sake of the people's rights. And that needs to end. And I think that the people are at a point where economic justice is the most important to them, to us. Um, as a nonprofit leader, I've worked on the ground level with people to struggle for the preservation of their rights, whether it be protecting women and children from abuse to preventing human trafficking in Hawaii. And I bring that knowledge and experience of working with people on the ground level to influence policy in Congress. And Councilman Anderson, what makes you more qualified than the other candidates here? I've seen policy making uh, from both sides, if you will, as a staff member for 12 years uh, and as a city council member for more than five years. Uh, additionally, uh, I'm also a young spouse. I'm a young parent. Uh, my wife and I are raising four children. Uh, we are doing everything we possibly can to make ends meet for our family. We survive on one income, mine. My wife uh, dedicates her time to taking care of the children, allowing me to dedicate my career to public service. Uh, but we face the same issues that many families in Hawaii face. We've got to pay a mortgage, we've got to put food on the table, put clothes on our children. Uh, and as an elected official, I think I've built a solid reputation as one who plays well with others. I'm a consensus builder, I've been able to bring people together, and I've been effective. In five years on the city council, I've passed more than 100 pieces of legislation. 
That's more than 20 uh, bills and resolutions per year. And I've been able to do that because I work with my colleagues and am able to bring people together and work from all sides. I've got some questions for, for each of you that are very individualized, so I wanted to start off with uh, Councilman Manahan. What is your position on marriage equality? No, I support marriage equality. And uh, for me, it's, it's, the issue is, uh, you know, if you're gonna create policy, I believe that you know, the policy uh, should not discriminate against anybody, but uh, having said that, I do support uh, marriage equality. And Senator Kim, a question for you. You oppose same-sex marriage in the legislature. Do you think your views go along with the mood of the country where courts are overturning the ban on gay marriage? Well, I think that's, for me, an issue that's a very personal one. It's uh, one that, um, as far as my religion, being a Catholic, uh, it is marriage is looked at as a religious sacrament. And so it does not reflect how I feel about uh, people who would like to have unions as far as uh, gay unions. I, my sister is gay. Uh, my uh, sister-in-law, who I chose to be my son's mother, um, godmother, is also gay. And I chose her because I felt that she'd be a good role model for my son, very loving, very caring. Uh, but again, it goes to this very personal issue on uh, a religious sacrament. And so I would like to see civil unions also offer the same Senator Tips. Kim, I'm sorry, I'm I have to interrupt you. We're having some technical difficulties right now. I apologize to all of you. We're going to go to our Hiki No <laughs> program right now as we correct some of these technical difficulties. We'll be back. I was never really confident about the skills that I have, but once I saw it in front of me on a TV screen, I felt, you know what, this is what I was meant to do. Hiki No is the first statewide <laughs> half-hour news show produced, written, and done strictly by students. Our students now can tell stories within our community. My favorite story I've written about thus far is probably the Heather Juni archive story. It's a story I worked really closely on and actually wrote myself. Me, myself, I don't know a lot about archives, but what I did learn was the power of preservation is the same, um, is the same passion that I have in the power of preserving our Hawaiian language and our culture, which I'm really into. These students, they live the story. They are, they actually know that story in and out because they live in that community. And, and it's not just our community, but it's now these other rural communities, the students in Molokai, the students in Lanai, the students in Kona, all of these small little rural communities who normally wouldn't have a chance to tell their story now have the opportunity to show the world what's going on in their community. It's their story told their way. If I want to do this for the rest of my life, it has to be that piece of my life. So by making PBS a piece of my life, it's given me so much. I can't repay PBS for all they've given me, but I can definitely keep producing stories that I know that they'll be proud of. I apologize. This is PBS Hawaii, and we are on Insights right now. I'm Mahialani Richardson. We are interviewing all seven candidates who are hoping to fill Colleen Hanabusa's seat in Congress. Uh, we're going to start back up again after we have some technical difficulties. And we were in the middle of speaking with Senator Donna Mercado Kim about same-sex marriage and your views. Uh, you voted against it in the legislature. Can you explain again, does that really go along with the mood of the country? It certainly is something that is very personal to people. And in this case, it was a personal issue with my religion and how I was raised. It did not affect how I managed the Senate. As Senate President, I facilitated passing the bill that was the majority. Part of my job as Senate President is to make sure that the majority of the views of the majority, and it did pass the Senate without any kind of fanfare, um, as well as the fact that my sister is gay and uh, my sister-in-law, who's my son's godmother, is also gay. And we, I chose her specifically because of her loving nature and caring and a good role model. So it does not have anything to do with the fact that marriage is a, a religious sacrament uh, as uh, how I was raised. And I would like to see civil unions be afforded all of the um, benefits so that these couples can have civil unions as well if they so choose uh, and have the same benefits as marriage afforded to them by the federal government. Councilman uh, Stanley Chang, you're in your first uh, term as a politician. Do you think you're ready for Congress? Yeah, 
I think we've had a great record of accomplishment already on the City Council. Um, for example, by tripling the amount of road maintenance funding. That was the number one complaint we got and we were able to work with our colleagues to make that a reality. Here in Hawaii, one of the initiatives I'm most proud of is the Hawaii Future Caucus. It's an initiative that was started by Representative Tulsi Gabbard and Aaron Schock, a Republican from Illinois. Um, here at the state level, we have Representatives Takashi Ono and Beth Fukumoto, again a Democrat and a Republican. And at the county council level, I'm the co-chair. And so I think it's incredibly important that we need to work together with people of all different kinds of backgrounds. And our first initiative as young people, as a bipartisan group of young people, is voter participation. And I'm very proud that the state legislature just passed a same-day voter registration bill that could increase voter participation as much as 10 percent. Senator Willis Barrow, it seems that uh, the problems in our prison system are getting worse. According to the media, there's escapes and suicides and sick leave, mm -hmm. and you're the chair of the Public Safety Committee. What responsibility do you bear for some of these problems, and what would you do about it at the federal level? At the legislative level, we have looked at reforms and changes and improvements within the Department of Public Safety. And we have implemented some of these in uh, parole. We've had reform in probation and in pretrial detainees or bail. We passed legislation regarding the justice reinvestment initiatives where you're seeing changes in positive movement. Uh, many of the problems, unfortunately, are, are due to the administration and the daily operations. I've had countless meetings and discussions with the, the department head and his deputy on how we can improve, and I know they're working, but there are issues that they have to also follow, for instance, dealing with the unions and the collective bargaining that has been going on. However, um, recently I did suggest to the governor that we have a legislative oversight committee that would monitor the prisons and jails because of the problems that we have been having. Um, at this time, he has not um, answered me. However, I believe we could have more independent eyes and individuals, and not only legislators, but other stakeholders out there that want to see an improvement and changes. But at the legislative level, we've also looked at rehabilitation because the majority of our prisoners, 95, 98 percent of them, will one day be released, and the majority of them will be in prison for less than 10 years. So we, make, we need to make sure that they are prepared when we release them, but at the same token, we have to keep those that are violent and those that are bad and evil criminals behind bars. What about at the federal level? Could you do anything about this? At the federal level, yes, we could provide resources and funding. Um, there have been, there's been legislation called the Second Chance Act that, led, that the Congress has passed, and it does provide resources in prisons, uh, mental health issues, because many of our prisoners have mental health issues, and even human services funding in terms of drug treatment and prevention. Ms. Jian, you're the only non-elected candidate who is not holding political office. What makes you qualified for this position, and are you a one-issue candidate? You know, it's really interesting whenever I get that question about being a one-issue candidate. Um, there is no such thing as a one-issue, a single-issue struggle, because we don't lead single-issue lives. Audre Lorde said that, and I believe it to be true. Um, I've dedicated my life to protecting the rights of women and children from abuse, uh, ending human trafficking, and raising our minimum wage to a livable wage, which we don't have yet. Um, rather than asking why I have dedicated my life to these areas, we should be asking why certain communities, certain members of our community, are, have been treated differently than others, right? And I think that people need to invest in the political process, but the only way they're going to do that is if they have somebody truly representative of their wishes and dreams for their families and for this country. Councilman uh, Ikaika Anderson, you're the only Native Hawaiian candidate. Uh, what would you do about the federal government's involvement in Native Hawaiian self-government, governance? Well, as a Kamehameha Schools graduate and uh, if elected to Congress as the only Native Hawaiian member of the 435 member Congress, I would favor federal recognition of, from the Obama administration uh, via rulemaking. And the reason I say that is because Senator Akaka spent more than a decade of his career trying to get Congress to finally recognize Native Hawaiians. It's something that needs to be done, and I believe that uh, through federal rulemaking, through the president, is the best way to do it. Additionally, in talking to Senator Akaka, He's extremely concerned that without federal recognition, 
Native Hawaiian programs, particularly those that benefit education with the Native Hawaiian Education Act, could possibly be challenged successfully at the Supreme Court level. You know, and the meetings going on right now are, are highly controversial, and do you think the federal government should be involved in those meetings? I believe the federal government has to be involved in those meetings, and I understand that emotions are running high. There are many in the Native Hawaiian community who feel hurt, and I certainly, as a Native Hawaiian, I understand that. But we do need to realize that the, the, the United States is not going to withdraw from Hawaii. The kingdom is not going to be restored in the capacity that it was prior to 1893. What we really need is a government-to-government -government relationship. The best way to have that happen would be through the federal rulemaking process and for President Obama to issue an executive order to that effect. Representative uh, Mark Takai, you've said that Veterans Affairs is one of your top issues and that it, we wanted to know, do you know, did you know that the system was broken? I think uh, as, as an um, enrollee in the VA system myself, I felt it. Um, I definitely knew it was longer than 30 days, not as long as 145. Um, but everybody in the system knows that the VA for many years have had some challenges. Um, I think what has come about through the investigations and what has happened in the mainland and clearly here in Hawaii has brought it to the forefront, uh, given people that weren't focused on the VA and weren't working hard to provide the benefits um, to our veterans. Uh, you know, it, it, it gives us an opportunity now to talk about it. In fact, uh, Congress right now, uh, for the first time in a long time, is uh, dedicating some time and real money, an additional $35 million, uh, to support our veterans. And I think it's, uh, it's appropriate and it's necessary because we got to lower the amount of wait time uh, for us in here, here in Hawaii. The other thing I, um, I'd like to see is <clears throat> I, I participate in TRICARE Reserve Select. It's a medical um, um, program for National Guard and Reserves. Uh, there's no reason why our veterans to the VA system can't participate. And in fact, the providers of that program are actually uh, private providers in our in our communities right now. This was such a shock for our Congress members. Did you feel the need to speak out about it when you knew about these problems at the VA? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, I've said a, a lot regarding that because I chair the military Veterans and Military Affairs Committee for the House, and you know this is a federal issue. However, we at the state level uh, have done what we thought uh, needed to be done to address some of the. Um, the, the VA services and the support services that we have here in Hawaii. For example, in 2009, we started the conversation uh, to create a veterans court. It is a collaboration between the judiciary, the legislature, and the VA system. It was the first in the kind here, um, second in the nation, and we're very proud of that. Um, and, and those are the types of collaborations from the state level that we're going to be able to uh, help um, in alleviating the concerns for the VA. We're getting a lot of questions from our viewers right now, uh, calling and tweeting and emailing into PBS. So I wanted to get to some of the viewer questions mm -hmm. right now. And this first one goes to uh, Senator Kim. Do you believe it was ethical for you to follow up on your son's law school application with the president of UH last year? Well, this is an issue of accountability. You know, I'm really big on accountable, being accountable, and my son needed to be accountable. And when he told me that he had applied for UH, and after the process was done, and we didn't receive a rejection letter or acceptance letter or a uh, incomplete letter. I thought it was uh, odd and so I asked and again said that the application went in and so I wanted to find out whether or not an application was received or not and you know like most moms and uh, most people you're going to try to get whatever whoever can give you that answer and certainly at the time Miss um, Greenwood, President Greenwood um, was a friend and we went to lunch together and had a cell phone and she called me often and I picked up the phone and said, hey, is there any way that I can get um, an information on whether or not you received an application? I said, I know the process is over. I don't want any special treatment. Just yes or no. It, you know, did he get an application? And, and apparently he did not put in his application uh, at that time. So really that was the intent of that whole thing and uh, she chose to um, misrepresent that. That's right, Marcy Greenwood felt that you sounded angry. Why would I, if 
be angry if I want to get an information on something. But that's what I do whenever I do my research and homework. And you try to f call the people that you know who could give you the answer. And certainly as a mom, I felt that I needed to hold my son accountable uh, for telling me that he, in fact, put an application when he didn't. And that was the end of that. Uh, this next question is for uh, Councilman Chang. Obviously, all Democrats right here. Is there one issue that you might vote against your party? That's a great question. Um, I think that this current uh, political climate means that people are all over the map on a number of different issues. Mm -hmm. And there are, for example, um, Democrats that oppose comprehensive immigration reform. That's an issue that's really personal to me. I, um, both my parents are immigrants from China. My dad came here in the 60s, started out as a beach boy, but he was able to buy a home, put my brother and me through school. And today, I just really worry that that American dream that was possible um, is slipping away from future generations of people. And so um, whether it's um, immigration reform, whether it's taking a hard pledge never to cut Social Security or Medicare, I think there are a number of issues that um, a number of Democrats may not be on the same page on. Uh, this question is for uh, Senator Sparrow. Uh, if elected, what would you do to help people in the middle class, especially those who ch can't even afford a home in the islands? Growth and development in Hawaii and Honolulu is going to be a major issue, and it currently is. This deals with housing, water, infrastructure, and the transportation infrastructure as well. Uh, we need to look at affordable housing as a mandatory requirement in all developments, and especially these multi-million dollar condominium projects, we should make certain that they put more money towards affordable housing and affordable rentals. We also, I believe, need to relook at what will be a housing unit or a sleeping unit in the future, because if you look at our homeless problems, for example, you know, there are ways that we can deal with these individuals. However, with so many people, with so many ideas, it doesn't seem like uh, we're getting down to the root problem. So we need to certainly provide more resources and have collaborations with the city, the state, the federal, and the nonprofit sector as well. And this is what question is from Waikiki, a resident there. Uh, his name is R.N., uh, Ms. Jian. The question is for you. The state has a problem, as you know, with sex trafficking. How specifically could you address this at the federal level? I have already been working on uh, with other um, advocates in D.C. Uh, on federal legislation, including the JVTA. And uh, this issue is so pervasive on both the federal and local level that it takes a bipartisan effort um, of, and also uh, an effort that includes community organizers as well as lawmakers on the highest levels. Uh, what I would do would be to push um, reform of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which comes up for reauthorization every four years, plus uh, support laws that are currently being looked at right now to focus on the true problem, which is the demand for prostitution and sex trafficking, as well as the traffickers that sell these women and children. And more needs to be done in that area because there is a problem with corruption on all levels uh, that allows for the proliferation of the selling of human beings, not just for sex, but also for labor. Uh, Hawaii has very significant problems with labor trafficking as well as sex trafficking. Uh, this question is from Tim via Twitter, and uh, he wants to know from you, uh, Councilman Anderson, would you support exempting Hawaii from the Jones Act? That's a great question. Uh, I support the Jones Act. Uh, so at this time, no, I would not support exempting Hawaii from the Jones Act. Hawaii has six ships that come here on a weekly basis to deliver goods to our shores. A recent government accountability office, and the GAO is the research arm of Congress, did a report on a possible exemption to the Jones Act for Puerto Rico. What that report found is that if there were any economic benefits to be had, First of all, the GAO could not identify them. Secondly, one of the main problems that could result, according to that GAO study for Puerto Rico, was the timing and the dependability of that scheduled shipping service. Until we could identify any possible economical benefits and until we could be certain that any exemption to the Jones Act would not interrupt the six scheduled 
shipping uh, containers that come here on a weekly basis, I would not be able to support an exemption. Councilman uh, Manahan, uh, someone on our Facebook page wants to know, uh, what's worse, big government or big business? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, well, in this day and age, um, I would just have to say that big business is, um, has really taken control of um, our economies on a global level. Um, and it's very difficult uh, for, for many of us, especially uh, candidates, uh, to be able to, to, for example, compete in or, or uh, have a level playing field in democracy. We have corporations now who can act as individuals, who can participate in elections with un, um, you know, unlimited amount of funding which I think uh, really for, for many of us here, uh, if, if, you're not in, if you're not receiving uh, that kind of funding, it, it really um, makes it difficult to have a good democracy and to have good voices out there. But uh, having said that, um, you know, I, I really think that, um, yeah, I, I really think that, you know, we, we need to rein in these uh, transnational corporations. I really think we need to give back to the people and level the playing field more for our um, for for the middle class and and for the lower income families here, our working families. Uh, Michael from Kahala has an interesting question, and it, it it's an issue for all Democrats. And uh, Councilman Chang, why don't I start off with you? Uh, if you are to be elected in the general election, you will be in a House of Representatives of with the majority of Republicans. How could you get anything done with the Republicans? Well, first of all, um, I hope that it won't be a majority of Republicans, but if it is, I think it's really important to be able to work with people of all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, on the city council, I think we get great training to do so. As I tell people, there's no such thing as a Democrat pothole or a Republican pothole. We all have to work together on these common issues. And that's really the same spirit that I would be taking to Washington because, you know, even with all of the bickering and the grandstanding, um, as a young person, I just want to get things done. And even in this climate, we have folks like um, John McCain, a Republican, and um, the Veterans Affairs Chairman Bernie Sanders, uh, a liberal member of the Senate, coming together on an issue like VA reform or members like Rand Paul, a Republican of Texas, and Bernie Sanders, again, coming together to oppose un, uh, unlimited government surveillance on individuals. So on those and many other issues, I think it's very important to work with all kinds of people and all kinds of backgrounds. Senator Espero, and I'll ask this question for all of you. Uh, if you were elected in the general and you're in the minority, how can you accomplish anything? What's most important is to be able to have a respectful conversation with your adversaries. Um, there are many issues where we will not be able to change the mind of our um, counterparts. However, what we need to do is respectfully look for that common ground. What is best for our nation, for our states, and how we can work together, Republican, Democrat, Independent, for the betterment of our nation. And I do have a reputation at the state capitol for being able to, to work with many individuals and to find out what is the best way that we can get to our goal so that we can pass some, some effective legislation. Ms. Yan, if you were elected, mm -hmm. is it just spinning the wheels for the Democrats in, in the major against the majority party? I think this is a really good question. And I think it begs for us to uh, examine exactly how Congress works. And I think it really calls to Congress persons to transform their positions into something that uh, is reflective of real change, which is get back onto the ground level, work interstate with other congressional members, uh, focus on an agenda that will work, like, such as the uh, amend amend amending the Voters' Rights Act, uh, focus on the purple states to get Republicans unseated. The Tea Party did it, we can do it as well. And if we don't start working proactively on the ground level in each of our states and join hands in doing so as well, then we're not going to move anything. Councilman Anderson, what's your response to that question? Well, as a member of the city council, I've worked with four mayors. I've worked with many different council members. Uh, I've always been able to bring people together. This past budget process at City Hall is a great example of that. You had the city council that proposed taking money from our road repaving budget to add to affordable housing and homelessness, and you had the mayor who was very upset about that. I came in, I brokered an agreement with my colleagues that we would simply leave the road repaving budget intact 
that we would offer an entirely new appropriation of $32 million to combine for more than $45 million to help with affordable housing and homelessness. That was agreeable to all parties. The mayor was pleased, the council members were pleased, and we were able to move forward. Uh, but I think it's those types of efforts that I've been able to do on the Honolulu City Council will serve me well in Congress. And in talking with Senator Dan Akaka, what made him so successful in Congress is that he was able to forge friendships with his colleagues. And with the most conservative of Republicans that he had to work with, even when they disagreed with Senator Akaka politically, they liked Danny Akaka as a person. And they wanted to help him be able to help the people who elected him. And I think in going to Congress, uh, people may disagree with Ikaika Anderson politically and philosophically, but I do believe that a majority of members will like Ikaika Anderson as a person and will be more than willing to work with him. Representative uh, Takai, what's your response if you were elected in the general election? How could you get anything done or pass any legislation that supports Hawaii uh, if you're in the minority? Well, I think the class of 2014 has an awesome opportunity. Uh, we, we do know that Congress is dysfunctional. We have um, extreme partisanship, people dug in on the left and the right. And I think it gives the new class an opportunity to bring people together. You know, the reason why we had sequestration, federal budget cuts, and furloughs uh, was because of Congress not working together. Now, you can only take a look at um, Senator Inouye and Senator Ted Stevens from Alaska. Senator Stevens was a Republican. Senator Inouye, as we all know, was a, Dem was a Democrat. They were the best of friends. And I think, uh, you know, we have some of that going on in the legislature and the city council. And, I think Hawaii is a very special place. I mean, we talk a lot about Senator Kaka and his aloha. Uh, you know, I, I would like to get to Congress uh, to bring a little aloha to, to Congress. The other thing that I'd like to do is um, the very first thing when I get there, there is 434 other Congress people. I want to in introduce myself and get to know them because, as we all know, y y you're, b you're more effective working together as friends uh, than not. And I think that's critical. But the, the bottom line here is that we have to have someone in CD1 who can build seniority. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I spent 20 years in the legislature. My family and I, if we get elected, we're willing to spend another 20 years. And the Democrats are going to take over one day. And at that point, it's going to be very important for this person representing this district to have enough seniority to take a subcommittee chairmanship or a chairmanship. Let's give uh, uh, Councilman Manahan a chance to answer that question. Uh, you might be the little guy in, in a House of Republicans. Well, thank you. Yeah, you know, for me, I, I think my, you know, Hawaii has offered me um, a wonderful training ground uh, to be able to uh, work with many different kinds of people, uh, especially now uh, serving in, in public office. Um, I believe my experience as a vice speaker um, you know, working with all the members of the House. We may not have been uh, so partisan, but you know, even within the Democratic Party, you have factions, but you have to bring people together in order to be able to get the work done. And I think that's the common ground that we can find with other members in Congress, is just finding those issues, that common ground where you, know, you really need to get the work done and you want to move things forward. Now, having said that, I really think um, you know, Hawaii is going to play a major role in the Asia-Pacific region in terms of the pivot into Asia. And I think it would benefit the members of Congress very much to come over here and see what we have here, the East-West Center, the Center for Peace, and really understand the Asia-Pacific region from our point of view. And that's what I would do. I would reach out to them. I would invite them here and say, hey, you know, take a look at what we have. You know, the cynics out there would listen and say, nah, I don't think the Democrats could really accomplish anything in Congress. Uh, Senator Kim, what, what was, what's your response to that if you were elected in the general? This is where experience really comes to play, Mahalani. Uh, 31 years in the House of Representatives and then bipartisanship in, uh, or nonpartisan in the Honolulu City Council. And when I got to the Senate, there were fractions of five, five, five. There are five factions uh, there. And I was able to bring them together to, in order to uh, form our leadership a coalition and get things going. I've reached out to the Republicans. I work very well with the Republicans. Under my presidency, a Republican has a, um, chairman, a vice chairmanship. As Senate president, I've traveled on many forums, and all of these forums, uh, they have 
Republicans and Democrats together. We don't look at our titles. We work together. And these are the kinds of forums that they are trying to work so that when we get to Congress that we can work together. Uh, and I think relationships are really important. And uh, I believe that I'm the only person here that has that leadership um, positions that can bring people together, have brought people together, and those relationships are what I'm going to work on when I'm in Congress because the people's problems are not Democrat or Republican. Uh, we have another question f via Twitter, and this is from Tim, and this is for all of you. Uh, Tim wants to know, should Hawaii be exempt from Obamacare? And I'll go ahead and start with Senator Espero. No. I mean, of course, there are pros and cons to Obamacare. But President Obama did what no other president before him had been able to do. Uh, Health care costs had been rising. They had been going out of control. There was much waste in the health care system. And the president passed the measure. And that measure is now going through a transition phase, of course, as it's being implemented. Um, we need to tweak it where we can. But there are many positive things, such as you know, not um, for people with um, pre-diagnosed um, illnesses. They can't be rejected. You know, having um, our youth at the age of 26, um, providing funding for businesses and other individuals so they can get their health care. Uh, this was an initiative to get 32 million people with health care. And I firmly believe that every citizen has a right to access health care. And we need to do what we can as a compassionate nation to make sure that these individuals are taken care of. Because if we don't give them a health care plan today, we're just going to have to pay for it when they go into the emergency room when they have no health plan at all. Ms. Yan, uh, people love Obamacare. They hate Obamacare. They're somewhere in between. Do you think that, what do you make of Obamacare and should Hawaii be exempt from it? No, Hawaii should not be exempt from Obamacare. I think we're all on the same page about that. Is Obamacare perfect? No, but no uh, uh, large-scale health care plan is, which allows us room for improvement. Um, there needs to be certain tweaks to it to allow its efficiency, and it was just passed into law. So the growing pains need to be completely vetted out, but the system works, and it's been proven. Councilman Anderson, what's your response to that? Uh, there certainly are challenges with Obamacare, but I do believe, I firmly believe, that we are better off today with Obamacare than we were before without it. Today with Obamacare, pre-existing conditions are a thing of the past. Today with Obamacare, dependent children are able to stay on their parents' health plan into adulthood when they're students. Today with Obamacare, women paying higher health premiums than men is a thing of the past. Because of those things and others, I do believe that Obamacare is a step in the right direction. It's certainly not perfect. But I believe it's much more advantageous to tweak the problems with Obamacare and to take a look at them as those problems arise than to scrap the whole thing and start all over again. Representative Takai, do you agree with that? Absolutely. <clears throat> the, well, I, I agree with everybody supporting Obamacare. You know, the reason why Obamacare was created was because we had uninsured people throughout the nation. We had a few here in Hawaii, too. Now, granted, any major piece, any major federal piece of legislation uh, there, there is some growing pains, and there are going to be some tweaks. But we are better off as a community, as a state, and as a nation with Obamacare. Uh, we've been working hard here in Hawaii uh, to, to, to work on the transitioning um, to make sure that our prepaid health care uh, prepaid health care act uh, fits with Obamacare. Um, we, we're looking at um, some innovation waivers, working with the feds. Um, all of those things are necessary uh, in, in significant pieces of legislation. So I think as a community, state, and nation, we're better off with Obamacare. Councilman Manahan, your thoughts on Obamacare and should, it, should Hawaii be exempt? No, I, I generally agree with uh, Obamacare. I think we had a very good prepaid uh, health care system uh, prior to Obamacare. And what Obamacare did was, uh, you know, they are own prepaid health care system. Now, having said that, um, it's not without its problems. Uh, we need tweaks. Uh, but I know the legislature uh, so unanimous, unanimously uh, supported a, an innovation waiver. Um, if we are looking at waivers, then it would have to be supported by the state, the legislature. But uh, overall, I think uh, Obamacare um, is a good uh, 
it's a good first effort. I think it needs work, but um, I think at the end of the day, it's beneficial for us. Senator Kim, your thoughts and what would you do at the federal level? Well, I believe your question is, should Hawaii be exempt? We're not talking about whether Obamacare for the rest of the nation is good or bad. And I differ. I say that we should be exempt. And if I go to Washington, D.C., that's one of the things that I'm going to work for is to get us exempt because we do have an excellent, excellent for years uh, prepaid health care. And uh, Obamacare should have been should have been framed around Hawaii's Prepared Health Care Act. And certainly the way it was rolled out, it was premature. There were so many problems. We have spent so much money while our vets are waiting to get health care, while we have so much problems with the people, um, Americans, and we're spending so much money on this rollout. And for 10,000 people here in Hawaii, it's going to raise the cost of health care for everybody else. I think these are serious issues that need to be looked at. And so we should be exempt and Obamacare should be tweaked on the federal level for the rest of the states that feel that they need it and it's helping them. But certainly there are ways that we can cover those 10,000 individuals without the kind of cost that we've had to pay with Obamacare. Uh, Councilman Chang, uh, most of the people here believe that uh, Hawaii should not be exempt, but you just heard Senator Kim saying it should be exempt. So where do you stand on the issue? I don't think Hawaii should be exempt from Obamacare. Actually, a lot of observers say that Hawaii has the best health care system in the country. And when we established the Prepaid Health Care Act in 1974, we achieved near universal health care um, almost 40 years before Obamacare. I actually think Obamacare does not go far enough. The only way to get truly universal health care in the United States and in Hawaii would be a single payer system. Another advantage of single payer was that it would cut out the estimated 25 to 30 percent of all our health care costs that are going to waste in administrative costs. Well, that could come down to as little as 5 percent under a single payer system. And so I think that Obamacare is a great step forward and I think Hawaii should be the champion to continue and go all the way to a single payer system. You know, Kelly from Honolulu has a question that just came in in terms of a GMO labeling. And uh, you ask a lot of uh, local politicians here, and they believe that we could leave that to the federal level. So, uh, Ms. Jan, what do you, what do you think about uh, the labeling of GMOs, and you, would you work to ban GMOs? I would. I'm opposed to the effort of corporations to privatize uh, the food system. Um, whether GMO development is healthy or unhealthy remains to be seen, but the people have the right to know what foods are genetically modified. Uh, the, relying on the federal government right now would be unwise if uh, we seek to label GMOs because they're ineffective. Um, so that's why I support, um, I would support home rule in allowing counties on the local level to pass their own GMOs. We need to do more on the local level. Federal money needs to uh, be spent in this area to allow for offices to be able to certify small businesses that uh, go into organic farming. Um, I would take it even a step further to regulate the disclosure of pesticides used for GMO development as well as general agriculture because there is a significant problem. I've seen this personally in my work with working with uh, labor traffic victims who work on farms. They suffer from very serious maladies from brain tumors. Let's give a chance for uh, Councilman Anderson to weigh in. And the banning GMOs altogether, would you agree with that? Well, as a policymaker, uh, no. I don't believe uh, that this is something that could be dealt with at the county level. Uh, in my years of working at the county level of government, the county simply don't have the expertise to engage in a labeling program, a successful one. The nutrition labels on our food are brought to us by the United States Department of Agriculture. I believe that labeling of genetically modified foods is something that we should do, but we should do it at the federal level. And that program should also likewise be administered by the USDA. They have the expertise, they have the know-how, they can implement that program. Representative uh, Takai, should GMOs be labeled and would you work to ban them altogether? A absolutely. I, I support the labeling of GMOs at the federal level. I think it's the appropriate place. Um, as was already mentioned, uh, um, the D United States Department of Agriculture has the expertise. Uh, labeling uh, foods is already done and I think for consistency's sake and for the ability to move food across uh, state borders and 
in, in our case uh, counties, um, I think it's important for consistency. So I would support labeling of uh, GMOs at the federal level. Councilman Manahan, what is your position on that? I support GMO labeling at the federal level. Um, I don't support, uh, well, you know, I got to respect the county's uh, individual uh, um, positions that they've taken uh, in terms of this issue, uh, in terms of the home rule issue. However, uh, having served at the state level, I really believe that the regulation, at least here within the state of Hawaii, uh, should be done at the state level. Um, I don't think it should be preempted, but rather it should be more transparent, uh, and we should know uh, what, what, you know, if there are pesticide issues, uh, I think people de uh, deserve to know that. I think people deserve to know uh, what, what they're putting in their bodies. But yes, the, the labeling should be done at the federal level. Um, we shouldn't preempt it, but we should be more transparent uh, uh, or require more transparency from the GMO companies here. Senator Kim, well, what do you make of that? Do you agree? I think that labeling should be done at the federal level. It, we tried looking at it at the state legislature and it would put our farmers, our local farmers, at a disadvantage uh, if we only did it locally because all of the food would be coming in from different parts of the mainland and they w wouldn't have to have the same kind of labeling where ours would. There's a lot of problems with that though and we really have to look closely because the devil's in the details. Issues is not just labeling, who's responsible for the labeling, who's going to enforce the labeling, what's going to happen if a label falls off, Who's going to be held accountable for that? Are there going to be fines? How much is that going to add to the cost of foods? So those are all very important issues that need to be dealt with, and I think they need to be dealt with on the federal level so all the states have an even playing field. Councilman uh, Chang, what do you make of the GMO issue, and would you support a complete ban on GMOs? Well, like the other candidates, I think GMO labeling is very important. There's no um, issue that's maybe more personal to our own bodies and to our own lives than the food that nourishes us, our families, our parents, our children. And a growing number of consumers are opting for GMO-free lifestyles. I think that the maximum amount of information should be available to consumers all over the country. I applaud um, those states and communities like Vermont and some of the counties here um, in Hawaii that have taken those first steps, I think it's time for the federal government to um, impose a nationwide GMO labeling program. All right, well, we, you know, we're very close to the end of our show, and, and uh, here at Insights, we wanted to know uh, one last question. Uh, if you could describe yourself in three words, I know three is hard to pick, but if you could describe yourself in three words, what would those words be? And uh, Representative Takai, why don't I just start off with you? Caring hard worker, three words. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Kim? Passionate, righting the wrongs, I guess that's three, three words. words. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's three. <laughs> Senator Sparrow, I actually missed you on the GMO question, so why don't you go ahead and uh, on GMO, answer on the GMO I'm, question, and then to, I'll give you the three okay. words. Uh, let me disclose that I love Hawaii papaya. And Hawaii papaya is here today, a multi-million dollar industry, creating jobs and exports for Hawaii because of GMO. And I am against banning GMO. However, like some of my colleagues up here, I do support looking at banning it at the federal level. And if you could pick three words to describe yourself? Energetic, optimistic, and qualified. Councilman Anderson? Uh, effective, sincere, and compassionate. Councilman Manahan? Empathetic and hardworking. Councilman Chang? Persistence and hardworking. And last but not least, Ms. Jian, three words to describe yourself. Uncorruptible by corporations. Well, I wanted to say thank you so much to all of you. It's been a very interesting hour. I hope all of you had a chance to uh, answer at least some of the questions. I know we got a lot of questions from our viewers, but we really appreciate all of you being here tonight here on Insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, next time on Insights, a week from tonight, Republicans Elwin Ahu and Kimo Sutton will tell us why they should be Hawaii's next lieutenant governor. Then political analysts will break down Hawaii's major races now that the voters have seen the candidates go against each other in public forums. That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahia Lenny Richardson. Ahui ho.